uh, NGO participation. Half, about roughly half of the participants at these COPs are representatives from NGOs. Roughly speaking, one quarter are journalists, and roughly speaking, one quarter are the actual representatives of uh, member nations uh, discussing the, uh, and negotiating the deal. This gives the meeting a different atmosphere. I keep comparing to other summits that I know, one was, that was here in 1995, the UN Social Summit, which was uh, for comparable size, 120 heads of state and government participated in that, but the NGOs were outside. Also compared to European Council, which is the, the summit we know best uh, in the foreign ministry, um, and the atmosphere is just different here. You do get uh, the, the alternative feel to it, it's not just uh, the ties and the suits talking, it has a different atmosphere when the NGOs are there in such numbers. But the NGOs in this sense are not just uh, the green NGOs like the World Wildlife Fund or Greenpeace and so on. These are also business NGOs representing oil interests and so forth, all types which are accredited by the UN. Some will not be accredited by the UN for different reasons, because they're too young or don't have the right uh, rules and procedure or, or not have, haven't shown a consistent commitment to the climate issue, whatever. Um, they will also be coming to Copenhagen or outside these numbers, but there is a parallel meeting going on in Copenhagen also specifically for NGOs that are not accredited out here in, in Copenhagen, which is likely to be a lot more colorful than what's going on out here. I won't bore you with the bureaucracy on, on how we're dividing tasks, but just to, to tell you that we set up, uh, we basically divided the task into four. There is uh, the negotiations, the substance. We set up a, a ministry for climate change and energy uh, where the minister there is, is heading our negotiations. There is logistics, that's what I do in the foreign ministry. Then there is public diplomacy, relations with NGOs and press and so forth. That is done uh, also by the foreign ministry, but another uh, department than mine. And finally, there are business-related activities. Because when we do this, uh, uh, when a country like ours uh, uh, play host to a conference of this size, of course we also have business interest in it. It's not the reason why we are investing in it and came, if you look at it, it uh, the ideas about this came later than the actual idea of setting up the meeting. Uh, but but climate-related uh, technologies, uh, clean tech is our fastest growing export. We do have solutions to offer in this field and therefore, of course, we're trying to create a platform also for our companies to come to market with the message that, hey, guys out there negotiating the deal, there are actually solutions ready on the table to be selected and implemented if the politicians decide to do something uh, about it. So this is the menu for a guy doing logistics. I won't bore you with uh, everything. Um, just one little point, uh, and that is, this is the usual stuff. You could, this is what you do when you host a wedding, and this is what you do if you do a large conference. It's always the same, it's just a matter of magnitude. But this time around, there are large expectations, I would even sometimes say extreme expectations, that we do this in a green and sustainable way. Logistics, this time around, have to prove that we can do it in a completely different way. Now, that is a difficult thing to do. Let me give you one example of that. Uh, here you have these uh, plastic bottles, uh, which is, from a climate point of view, a terrible thing to do. Uh, one person told me that producing one liter of water in this way wastes about 13 liters of, of drinking water, and it also, of course, entails a lot of unnecessary uh, CO2 emissions just from the transportation alone. Not really a cool thing to do if you have high-quality tap water right out of the tap. Logistically, this is the easy thing. This is what you usually do. You take a couple of trucks, fill them with half-liter bottles like this, and you put them in on the table in the conference centers as they are drunk. Waste is easy. You just put them in the bins. And whenever the table is empty, you put some more bottles up there. That's easy. But it's not the climate-friendly way to do it. So what we've decided is, uh, uh, as just an example, there won't be any plastic bottles out here for the conference. We'll put up little uh, automats. You might have seen one out here. We can get cool drinking water directly uh, from, from the net and from, from the tap. But when you do that, you need to start calculating what is the actual, um, what is the actual uh, drinking uh, levels expected in each part of the center. Uh, what, what will people be drinking from? Will they be drinking then from, from uh, cornstarch cups or maybe recycled paper cups? Or should we opt for porcelain or glass, reusable uh, uh, dishes, that, uh, cups that then need to be washed up? 
according to a schedule, so you need to have a little guy running around with a little trolley, picking up the cups and washing them up and putting them back. But to, to do a schedule like that, then you need to calculate how, uh, how much water is being drunk in which parts of the center um, so that you can have the, the manning power set up in the right way. This is just to tell you, and then you need to communicate to all the delegations coming here who usually get the message, don't drink the local tap water. You have to tell them it's okay here. And here are all the, here are all the analysis of why this is okay uh, precisely on this spot. So my point is that it was what is usually a very simple logistic task, if you want to do it in a sustainable or green way, becomes enormously complicated. So when you hear media reports in December about uh, some corner of what we've done here logistically not being the greenest and most sustainable way to do it, some carpet material or some energy used in some device in the kitchen or whatever, uh, send me a nice thought and say, well, it, it's not that easy uh, to get everything under control. Basically, when we do greening for a conference like this, um, greening is, is actually only priority number four. Priority number one is security. We will not put any delegate into a little electrical uh, light car if they need a bulletproof limo. Secondly, logistics will, in our, into the very bones, support the decision-making structure of a conference like this. We will not make greening measures that in any way hamper the effort to reach an agreement in, in Copenhagen. So people will not be hungry, they will not be cold, they will not be late, and they will not be offended by protocol in the way we treat them here. That would not be a climate-friendly approach when we're discussing climate policies. Thirdly then, we're not even at greening as the top priority, but the third priority is showcasing the solutions that are out there. Rather than just picking the greenest limo for heads of state and government, you will see us picking um, a, a host of technologies. So you will see hydrogen cars, you will see second, second generation bioethanol, you will see hybrid cars, fuel cells and so on, uh, biogas, electrical vehicles and so on. So a whole many of them, which is more important to us, showcasing that there are solutions for the way we usually do things, rather than just picking the greenest option itself. Then finally, when these things are in place, uh, then the fourth priority is doing everything we can to try to make a sustainable conference. 